Hello, I'm Dr. Jeremy Flowers, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Good News from the Great. We invite you to a time of biblical information and inspiration. We invite you to this morning's broadcast, as it's currently in progress. And it's all of God's children who said, Amen. How blessed are we to be God's people in God's place, to learn more about God's promises, so that we can live in perpetuity with God forevermore, by and by. We want to thank all of those who led us in our devotional period as they escorted us before the very throne of God. We're thankful for those who opened, those who prayed, and those who led us in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. We want the Grand Road Church to be cognizant that as we continue in this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that beginning this week, we will be refreshing and revamping some of our online and media offerings. We've been doing something every day as a family, and we pray that you have thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, why are we refreshing and revamping, Dr. Flowers? Because uh, we want to decrease monotony and over-familiarity. Uh, sometimes you can do something over and over again, and it's time to refresh and revamp for even greater success. Someone would say, well, we've been doing the same thing for the last 16 weeks, uh, and it's a good thing. And I will tell you that sometimes good can be the enemy of best. Uh, so we always desire to be better. So be on the lookout. Uh, there'll be a mailing sometime this week, and you, we communicate with you about some of the things we're doing to continue the freshness of our weekly gatherings. Every single day, Gray Road, there's something that you can be doing with your family here at the Gray. As it is not a surprise to most of you, today we begin a new sermon series entitled Mountain Top Revival. Mountain Top Revival. So what I plan to do over the next several weeks is lift up several themes from the Christological Sermon on the Mount. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, the Sermon on the Mount is inclusive of the Gospel of Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. The Gospel of Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So if you want to follow me the next 10 weeks, we're going to be either in Matthew 5, 6, or 7. Also, for your benefit, we will move chronologically through the text. Meaning we're going to start at the beginning and work our way all the way to the end of Matthew chapter 7 when we talk about the wise and or foolish builder. So we pray that you will join us every single week. You will tell somebody else to join us every single week. We pray right now that every single person watching this right now will go ahead and share it on your social media platform. Share it on Facebook. Share it from YouTube so that somebody else can in fact be blessed. Go ahead and share right now. Go ahead and start a watch party right now as we begin this series entitled Mountain Top Revival. Meet me if you would in the gospel according to Matthew chapter number five. The gospel according to Matthew chapter number five. As we look here at the Beatitudes in verse number one, I could preach nine different sermons probably from the Beatitudes. Uh, but here we're going to try to put it all in one. Is that all right? Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 1. Wherever you are, we would ask now that you be standing in reverence to the word of God being read. Matthew chapter 5, beginning there, verse number 1. Uh, Matthew, the tax collecting Jew, speaks specifically to Jews. And Jesus is speaking and says these words. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they in fact will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who appear in heart, for they will see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil about you against me because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, they also persecute you. If you have some time this morning as the Holy Spirit of God shall lead me, I want to speak from the thought, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let us go to God in prayer. Devil and kind and gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what was, what is, and what will be as long as we continue to stay faithful. Father God, we pray that you be with everyone under the sound of my voice. Open their minds, their hearts, their spirits, their souls, and yes, even their ears to hear a word coming straight from you via your manservant. Your manservant is weak. Your manservant is faulty. Your manservant is, is frail. Sometimes even your manservant is fake. Father, I pray now that you allow fresh water to come even from a dirty cup. Father, forgive me of my own sin. And from my repentant heart, Father, I pray that you speak to me and speak through me. Allow the connection to remain on this day. Allow your word not to return for me. Father, allow us. Allow me now ask dirt to speak to dirt so we can all clean up our dirty ways. Father, bless your word. Father, bless your servant. Father, bless us all as your children. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I just want to be happy. I encourage you to meet me on the mountaintop for the next few weeks. I aim to encourage us weekly to ascend so that we can learn, so that we can descend to live what we've learned. Why mountaintop? So that we can remove all distractions and unnecessary interactions. As we sit in the solace and solitude of currently a pandemic, I want us to metaphorically look toward the mountain top. For it's there that we can receive much needed clarification. For sometimes we need to remind ourselves of that which is seemingly elementary so that we then can prepare ourselves for eternity. So as we sit currently with minimal distraction, no sports, no vacations, lesson interaction. As we sit today with minimal distraction, let us hear from God as he sits in a higher place while simultaneously calling us to a higher purpose. This sermon series will touch you, if not even transform you. Say it again, Dr. Flowers. This sermon series will touch you, if not even transform you. For no one leaves the Sermon on the Mount narrative on stage. No one leaves the Sermon on the Mount narrative on stage. For it's here that Jesus speaks to his disciples concerning them, fixing their attitudes and intentions. He tells us about dealing with our hatred and dealing with our hearts. He tells us about lust sexual immorality and adultery. He tells us about marriage and divorce. He tells us about keeping our promises. And it's interesting that marriage and divorce is in between lust, sexual morality, and adultery and keeping your promises. He talks to us about retribution, retaliation, and vengeance. He speaks to us about loving those who despitefully use you. He speaks to us about being generous. He speaks to us about the need to pray in regards of accuracy, frequency, and technicality. He speaks to us about fasting, about proper dedication and perspective, about worry and anxiety, about passing judgment on others, about asking and receiving from God, about eternity's path and ecclesiastical prophets 
and about ascertaining a proper spiritual foundation. And if you don't have a problem with any of those things, then child of God, you got a problem with lying. Noah will leave the Sermon on the Mount narrative on scale. And as we gander this morning at Matthew 5 and 1, we must also simultaneously gather Luke chapter number 6. For the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew and the Sermon on the Plain in Luke are sisters while not being twins. Now, uh, there are nine major themes in the Beatitudes by themselves. I told you earlier, I could preach nine different sermons just from the Beatitudes. I'm going to try to put them all in one. Really, 18 different sermons can be extracted from this one Messianic sermon. So I ask that you give me just a few weeks to disseminate the strength of the proverbial sermon on the mount. Now, by way of textual reconnaissance, understand that the Sermon on the Mount is the first of five didactic discourses uh, as written by Matthew. Uh, the Beatitudes here are to be followed by what's known as the missionary discourse, the parabolic discourse, the discourse on the church, and of course, the discourse of eschatology and or the end of times. And while the Beatitudes by nature are dialectic and paradoxical, understand that Beatitudes are actually a Latin derivative for bless. Say it again. The Beatitudes are actually a Latin derivative for the term bless. We see bless nine different times in the Beatitudes. So it's here that we are entreated by instruction by way of countercultural juxtaposition. Because it's here that Christ thrusts us toward a higher calling by teaching us things that are countercultural to their time and our time. Thus, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he contrasts carnality to Christianity. Now, I know some of y'all want your shout. But the Sermon on the Mount is, is very instructionary. I pray you came uh, to come to school. As I tell Ray Road often, you got to go to school before you go to church. So, so, so if you want, you know, the Lord of happiness and joy and peace and all those things, uh, Jesus gets to that. But there's some things that we have to learn. And really, if you trace the Sermon on the Mount, it seems to build us to greater faithfulness. Meaning what? You cannot even capture Matthew chapter 7 and building a spiritual foundation if you don't first catch Matthew chapter 5 and the basic attitudes that we must be in the Beatitudes. So it's here on this mountainside that Jesus transcends the law to a new level of love, truth, and grace as fulfilled within his incarnate flesh. And then after teaching man. He gives these lessons back to man so they can then leave and live how he showed them to live. So Matthew chapter 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, understand the word now is in relation to after Christ's temptation in the wilderness, which is Matthew chapter 4, which is also subsequent to Jesus' birth and baptism. Now, as a term, here demarcates Jesus' preparation as it precludes here Jesus' premier presentation, i.e. the Sermon on the Mount. And here, it is Jesus' homily that would bring harmony between law and love, as well as history and holiness. Say it again. The Sermon on the Mount is a homily that brings harmony between law and love and history and holiness. Holiness. Now, understand the crowd. Understand that we see either the 12 disciples and or Luke would say the 72 disciples. But we understand that in addition to the disciples, whether they be 12 or 72, there was a multitude that looks just like me and you. They're up here on the mountainside, not knowing if what the mountain is. Some say it's the Mount of Beatitudes. Some say it's the Mount Sinai of the New Testament. But rather we find ourselves at a mountainside. 
We find ourselves with his disciples who have just been named in Luke chapter number 6. We see the 12 standing here before the multitude. And what we see here is possibly an ordination sermon. But I'm so glad that they were in the audience and I'm so glad that I am in the audience because he's calling his disciples to a higher level of purpose, not just those 12, but every single one of us need to adapt and adopt these precious promises and precepts as outlined in the preaching of Jesus the Christ. He's here on the mountainside. He sits down. By the time I would tell you, this is the position and the posture of the Jewish rabbis. They sat and stood instead rather of standing. And also I would tell you by being on the mountaintop, I would tell you by sitting down before the crowd, I would show you the pedagogical value of ascension for the means of amplification and then sitting to suppose both hierarchy due to position and humility due to submission, but I don't have time for that. He's sitting there on the mountaintop. His disciples come to him whether 12, whether 72, whether me and you. And what does he do? He begins to teach the gospel. He begins to teach them. Now understand what Jesus does. He fulfills the Pauline mandate to Timothy and preach the word. For this homily did not seek to bring harmony between carnality and Christianity. But rather the homily, the sermon here, seeks to extract his disciples. Both then and now extract us from carnality, humanism, heathenism, and utter worldliness. He wants us to come up a little higher. It's here that Jesus intended to change and transform their attitudes and dispositions within them that were ingrained in them now for the benefit of his name. He wants us to adhere to these Beatitudes because these Beatitudes demand a change in attitude and behavior from a societal context to a spiritual and salvific context. It reminds us, church, that good preaching ought to alter behaviors. It reminds us that good preaching and teaching and learning ought to then be the basis of good living. This sermon and all sermons remind us that these are in fact the words of life. Preaching is God's voice. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians. Peter says it in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse number 11. If any man speaks and speak as if the oracles of God. Some people say, well I can't, I can't hear him preach. I can't hear anything he got to say because of how he lives. Child of God, don't get so caught up on the vessel. That you can't be blessed by the contents. That wasn't in my notes, but it feel good right there. Understand that what is preached must be heard as the very words and voice of God. It's God's word that elevates man. So that the elevated man can then dedicate himself to a higher calling. Prerequisite of higher principles. Understand that the attitudes are the higher principles that allow us to achieve a higher calling so that one day we can reside in a higher place. Amen, Brother Flowers. Preach the word. So understand. I know I give you a lot of background, but see, the next several weeks you need this background uh, to understand the foreground. Uh, the Beatitudes illustrate the correct and Christological attitude that we must have. Now, for my note takers, let me say this slowly. The Beatitudes illustrate the correct and Christological attitude in regards to ourselves, our sins, our Lord, and our world. That, that's really, uh, that really the, 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 line, uh, the line up for today, or the outline, excuse me, for today. Uh, the Beatitudes illustrate the correct and Christological attitude as it regards, number one, ourselves, number two, our sins, Number three, our Lord. Number four, our world. Now, also, uh, for the note takers, I believe that the Beatitudes really are a stair-step model toward happiness. Meaning what? Step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If you really want to be happy, we must achieve these things in stair-step model. And then we can be the salt. Then we can be the light. But we first 
must achieve happiness in a stair step model. And that begins with verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It begins being countercultural because we never see blessed and poor in the same sentence. Oh, if I had time, I would tell you, honey, child, sister, girl, and brother, man, you can be blessed and poor. You can be poor and at peace. And see, the problem is we automatically assimilate uh, poverty to punishment. And, and, and we must have wealth and position and fame and, and that's what gives us blessedness. When Christ says no, it's countercultural. Don't you know that the majority of the globe's population is poor? But the fact of the matter is Jesus is speaking then and I'm preaching now that you can be poor and happy. You can be poor and at peace. It's interesting. Blessed here. Makarios means supremely blessed, fortunate, and happy. So when I see blessed, I see happy. If you want real happiness, it's in the word of God. If you want real happiness, it's in the instruction of God. If you want real happiness, it's in the word, the will, and the way of God. I know that sounds cliche, but child of God is true because you can have everything the world has to offer you and still not be happy. Or if I had time to quote some hip hop, I would say it is more money and more problems. Here yeah, to them, this audience, when they hear blessed, to them it meant divine joy and perfect happiness. See, this word of blessed was not used in relation to humans, but rather it meant a joy that can only be experienced by gods and deity. Blessed here implies an inner satisfaction and sufficiency that did not depend on outward circumstances for its happiness. That's why we talk about joy, how joy is from God, and how joy is something that only God can give. Oh, child of God, I want joy in my life. I want this macarius in my life. I want this type of blessedness in my life. And it's when I understand what blessedness really is, then I really know what it is to be blessed because blessed is an internal thing, not an external thing. And when it becomes an internal thing, then it prepares me for eternity. See, blessed means I don't care about the external circumstances because I know I got something stronger within me than whatever goes on. Outside of me. Oh, if I had time, I would quote, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Blessedness. Don't you know this morning that you are blessed? Yes, you're blessed because you're breathing. Yes, you're blessed because you're sitting in a house. Yes, you're blessed because you're watching online, which means you must have some type of electronic and wireless internet. But understand that your blessedness has nothing to do with the external things. You can be poor and blessed in the hospital and blessed in jail and blessed nine times Jimmy we see blessed nine times happy nine times Macarius but of the nine times that qualify us as blessed none of them seemingly quantify spiritual happiness by means of money fame and popularity None of them say nothing about wealth and fame and humanistic perception. Meaning what? I don't care if you think I'm blessed or not, honey. I'm still blessed. <sighs> we must also learn that real blessings and the things that make God happy will be those things that really make us happy. Nine times. Macarines. Nine times. Blessed. Nine times. And every one of these out there speak of what we must do. Meaning that blessedness and happiness while God given are actually up to us. Your happiness depends on you. Your blessedness depends on you. So therefore, while we are responsible for our own spiritual happiness, we are responsible for our spiritual happiness on the premise of God's provision. God gives it, but we must get it. Well, I ain't happy. Whose fault is that? Because real happiness begins in God's way. 
Are you following God's work? Are you following God's will? Are you traveling God's way? If so, you're blessed. Well, I don't have everything I want to have. You're blessed. So, blessed are the poor. Poor how? In spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. You can't be blessed and poor. This ain't talking about money. But mentality. Those who are poor in spirit. God's trying to bless you. God's trying to bless the contextual audience. God's trying to bring them to a higher plane and a higher place. God is trying to instruct them in discipleship. And he says, the first thing you must understand as a disciple is that you are poor in spirit. Numa, Numa being what? The breath of God. You are spiritually bankrupt. What do you mean I'm spiritually bankrupt? God can't bless you until you first realize that you're broken. You want to be a disciple? Lesson number one, it ain't about you. You ain't got nothing. We are unworthy. And without God, you're no earthly good at all. Rule number one, well, I read my Bible, I pray every day. That ain't rule number one. Rule number one, to be a disciple. Rule number one, to finding true happiness, is to look inside of myself and say, Jeremy, you ain't no earthly good. You are spiritually bankrupt. You are undeserved. You are unworthy. And God says, look here. Once you, remember, once you remember that you're broken, now I can bless you. Once you remember your blank slate, then I can write the story of your life. The poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If I had time, I would tell you the difference between the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. Matthew did not want to speak to a Jewish audience about God directly, so he speaks of heavens cosmically, but I don't have time for that. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse number four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What are you trying to say? To become a disciple, Clyde, not only must you understand that you're spiritually bankrupt, not only must you understand that we are unworthy, but then your past and your sins ought to put you in a position of grief and mourning. And there, guy, I, I'm so inadequate. Step one, but I'm so inadequate as it relates to the gospel of Christ that it makes me weep, grief, and mourn. For it's when you know that you are spiritually destitute that we begin to mourn over our undone condition. See, there are a lot of people, Kayla, uh, who confront their brokenness, but then callously condone it. I know I'm not the only one in cyberspace. Whoever tried to make justification for their sins. I know I'm not the only one in cyberspace who looks sometimes at their past sin and gloat over how good I thought it was. Good, if you would have caught me 20 years ago, what I used to do, where I used to go, how did I used to stay up? See, child of God, part of discipleship says I am inadequate and I'm even ashamed of how I used to live. I've confronted my brokenness and I no longer condone my brokenness. I realize that sin and all faults separates me from my success. We mature when we come to a point where we see the sin in our history month and stop gloating in his memory. We see the sin of our history and stop gloating in his memory. Give me some script with that lip. I'm so glad you asked. Come here, Paul. Romans 6, 21. What benefit did he reap you at the time for the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things which what? Result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin, you become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Verse number 23 of Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you mourn these sins, You'll be comforted. Verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. People don't like to be meek. Only two characters in scripture were defined as meek. That's Moses and Jesus. And we don't like being meek. For these Jews to hear, blessed are the meek, they would think, I ain't no punk. Shouldn't have said that out loud. I ain't no punk. I ain't weak. I'm from Detroit. That just came right to my, my, my voice right there. Bad preacher. Uh, because we're taught, ain't nobody gonna walk over me. Ain't nobody gonna step over me. I ain't gonna be me. But child of God, if we're gonna be Christian.
Christians, we have to learn some meekness, and meekness is not weakness. It speaks of humility. It speaks of mildness of disposition. I, I, even the term speaks of being gentle. It's the outgrowth of a renewed nature. Because trust me, meekness is not a natural quality. Well, I'm sure for you, Doc, it is. No, it ain't. Don't come at me wrong. I, I wish I had somebody in here. Let, let, let me make this more tangible. Meekness gives a word picture of a domesticated wild animal. Meaning what? The animal never stopped being strong. It never stopped being energetic. It never stopped having strength. But now its energy, its strength, and its power is channeled by its master. Oh, some of y'all miss y'all shout on a Sunday morning. Uh, meekness is a domesticated animal. Yes, meekness is strength under power. But, but it gives the, uh, 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 of a domesticated animal. I, I still got teeth. I can still bite you. I can still get you if I wanted to. But I have now decided in being meek to channel all my strength to my master. I'm saved, but I ain't soft. I think sometimes uh, we, we make it comical and say, I'm saved, but I still got these hands. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I'm me. Don't think I'm weak. I just chose to give it over to the master. Yeah. Ah, don't make that okay, okay. If I can learn how to be me and not cuss you out like I want to. Bad preacher. If, if I can learn how to be me and, and not give you what you really deserve. If I can learn how to be meek and not retaliate and have vengeance and hatred in my heart, then what? I'll inherit the earth. Now it's interesting because with a changed attitude, I told you everything here is stair step, right? With a changed attitude, then we get a changed appetite. <laughs> Verse number six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Hunger, crave ardently. Thirst, uh, one who's, who, who's painfully at want and needing to be satiated. Meaning what? When we change our attitude, then our appetite changes. We want the things of God. We're so hungry and so thirsty. For what? Things of righteousness. What is righteousness? It means things that allow us to be approved and acceptable before God. See, when we change our attitude, then we change our appetite. Meaning what? Doc ain't got to beg you every day to come to the online platforms. He ain't got to beg you to come to prayer and devotion and Great Road University and the women's hour and the men's hour and the empowerment hour and everything else that we have. Why? Because you're hungry and you're thirsty for the things of righteousness. And guess what? When you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, Great Road ain't got to put it on. They ain't got to tell you when to study. You can't wait to study on your own. You can't wait to call somebody. You can't wait to fellowship. Because you hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? Because I just want to be acceptable unto God. Ooh, when your attitude changes. When you understand that you're poor in spirit. When you mourn for who you were. When you understand that I'm meek and not weak, but I'm domesticated power. Then you say, my attitude is now different. My appetite is different. I want to be better. And I cannot be acceptable unto God. Unless I'm filled with his word. Therefore, I want to do everything possible to put myself around the word. So I can imbibe the word. So I can grow and germinate in the word. But guess what? When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, God says, look here, I'll make a buffet for you. You'll be filled. You'll have, uh, it's really an agricultural livestock word. You'll have so much within you that we got to take it out of you. Verse 7, I'm having fun. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Listen, and, and this actually comes up again in Matthew 7 in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, blessed are those who forgive uh, because they've been forgiven. Um, mercy and grace are two different things. Grace, we need both. Grace is favor I don't deserve. Mercy keeps me from that which I really do deserve. Let me make this tangible.
Grace gets me to salvation. Mercy keeps me in salvation. I believe as Paul says in Ephesians 2, it's by grace through faith that we're saved. Why? Because God has given us what we don't deserve. God kept us alive long enough to come into his kingdom, come into his glory, come into his salvation. But when we are saved, we all do some stuff that we should not do. And I'm so glad that God does not give me what we deserve. And let me say something else because I'm already here. Uh, 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 blessed, uh, blessed are those who are merciful, they'll be shown mercy. God never gives us what we really deserve. And thank God he doesn't. So why are we so apt to give everybody what they deserve? Then we have the audacity when somebody gets caught up to say, well, they finally got what they deserve. Who are you? So if you want real blessedness and happiness, put away vengeance. Be merciful to people. Give them better than what they deserve. If you do that, God will continue to give you better than what you deserve. You'll be happy. You'll be blessed. At least you get to sleep at night. Stand up all night worried about somebody else and what God's going to do with them. Be happy for what God's doing with you. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who seek to do good. Blessed are those with good intentions and motivations. Remember, God judges the heart. Not the mouth. The gospel writer says that that which comes out of the mouth first starts in the heart. I tell people all the time, Ray Rhodes heard it many times, people love saying things and, and saying, well, uh, sticks and stones are breaking my bones, but words will never hurt me. You ain't never been married. Say amen when you can. Uh, words do hurt you. Uh, you remember words more than actions. Hello, somebody. Now, you ever been in any type of relationship, friendship, marriage, whatever, and you, you forgot what somebody did, but in 1995, you told me. Words do hurt. When many people say words, and say, well, that's not what I meant. Yes, it is. Yes, Father, the heart, the mouth speaking. Now, the, 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 the apology may be, I should have been thinking like that, but we don't have idle words. They came from a deeper place. So he says, look here, happiness is those who are pure and heart. Happiness are those who have good motives and good intentions. And can I tell you something? Everybody in here, everybody in cyberspace has done the right thing with the wrong motives. We got to check our motives. Got to check our motives. Got to check our motives. We'll never have happiness. See, have you ever done something but you did it the wrong way and with the wrong heart and you finally got what you thought you wanted? And then didn't want what you thought you wanted when you got it. Because God gave it to you. Because you were doing the right thing. But you had the wrong. Oh, yeah, I don't want that. Yeah, yeah. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will do what? See God. Not only is the beat, not only are the beatitudes step step, but notice that the revelation and, and what you receive, it grows. After every single beatitude that I master, I get more. So now I'm at a point where I'm pure in heart. I had to start with recognizing that I was poor in spirit. I had to understand to mourn for my past. I had to understand I had to be meek. I had to understand to change my attitude and my appetite. I had now, and I'm blessed to the point to where I can now be pure in heart. You can't even get to the place where you're pure in heart until you understand that you're broken in spirit. But when I get here, Marvin, and I get to the place where I'm pure in heart, guess what's happening now? I'm seeing God. I've already inherited to the earth. I've already inherited to the kingdom of God. I've already been comforted. I've already been filled. But now, just now, I can see God. Can I give you some more? I'm almost done. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called what? Children of God. Oh, I was so glad when I could see him. Oh, how good and how glad I should be now. I can be called his child. Why? Because peace is a family trait. I've been a child of God. Those, it's important that we make peace, understanding that peace was first made at the cross, and that all peace is found in the fact that Christ is in fact sufficient. Can I point something else out here and I'm done with this text? With this verse rather? <laughs> Blessed are who? The peacemakers, not peacekeepers. A whole lot of us want peace and we feel the only way to get peace is to keep peace and not make peace. Sometimes peace demands war. 
You gotta like that, okay? Sometimes peace demands conflict or at least confrontation. Too many of us are peacekeeping and not peacemaking. That's why you're sweeping everything under the rug. Church ain't right. Home ain't right. Self ain't right. When the Lord said, blessed are the peacekeepers, that's not what he said. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peace is in Christ, but sometimes in order to get in Christ, you have to confront what conflicts you to get Christ centered. I got to make peace, which means sometimes I got to cut some things out of my life. Cut some things out of my perspective. Cut some people out the box. Why? Because I'm making peace. I'm making peace. I'm making peace. I'm getting closer to God. They'll be called children of God. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Well, hold on, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I was with you. With Jesus, you, you know, blessed, 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 blessed. I, I got all these things going in my favor. Every time I do one thing, I get to do another thing. I get closer and closer to God. Good. Now that you are a child of God, then it reverses. You're going to be persecuted. What? I've been comforted. I've been filled. I've seen God. I'm a child of God. Great. I built you up so that now you won't be broken. Had I brought persecution before you realize that all sufficiency is in me, you wouldn't be able to handle it. I had to bless your attitude and bless your appetite before I brought persecution. Now, the problem is, too many of us claim to be children of God, we are not fed by the word of God, then we give up persecution and we're broken by the word. Why is it so important? Why we gotta have sermons that are so long? Why we gotta have all these Bible classes? Why we gotta have praying devotion every day? I want to have some time for myself. Child of God, the world will give you no time. The world will not give you time to recuperate. You wanna be hungry? You wanna fill yourself up? So you have energy to deal with persecution. Blessed are those, you're gonna be happy in the midst of persecution. People are going to harass you, mistreat you. And guess what? Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Meaning what? They are persecuted because they are seeking to be approved from God. Meaning what? Stop saying that it's, it's a blessing in being persecuted when it's your own fault. You got to like that. Okay. Sometimes we're suffering not for God's sake, but for our sake. You got to like that. Okay. Jeremy does some dumb stuff. And Jeremy faces consequences and punishment for dumb stuff. I cannot then say, well, God is blessing me. He's testing me. Uh, you know, uh, blessed is he who goes through persecution. Yes, for my sake and my righteousness, the stuff you and I may be going through, we might deserve. Then we want mercy. <laughs> but if you're doing the right thing for me, even then you're going to face persecution. Remember, the historicity behind this is that uh, they're going to face persecution and scorn. They're going to be uh, killed. They're going to be ran out of cities because their love for God is telling them if you want to adapt this type of lifestyle, history, and in presently, that you're going to face persecution. See, the church today doesn't face much persecution because it doesn't do much proclamation. But if we start proclaiming God from our voices and our lives, We'll face persecution. Okay. Then verse number 11. Blessed are you. People assault you, insult you rather, and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you. Meaning what? If you're proclaiming, you'll be persecuted. People are going to say all kinds of things. See, see, don't ever get messed up in church. A lot of folk get messed up in church and they leave the church altogether. And every time somebody leaves the church, it's never because of the institution. It's because of the individual. So I've been preaching long enough, Clyde, to hear folks say ignorant stuff. Jeremy, I don't like you. I ain't coming to church no more. Well, how foolish is that? That you have a problem with me, so you're going to get out of communion with God? Well, I'll stop coming because Marvin said something to me. So what? People are going to say all kind of evil against you. Even when you're doing God's will and God's word. So we must stay on God's way. I can tell you, everybody who's anti-God is not outside the church of God. Some people, ah, uh, I had time to quote India R.E. One shot to the heart without breaking the skin. Can't nobody hurt you worse than you can. Sometimes that happens in church. Okay, now, now. 
Verse 12, I gotta cut it. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the prophets that were before you, the same way they persecuted you. Now, I'm gonna start next week talking about murder. So let me go ahead and wrap verses 13 through 17 in here for those who are hooked on the chronology of the text. Um, the Beatitudes are important. Once I adapt them and adopt them, then I get to the point where God can then present me as what? The salt and the light. So verse number 13 says, you are the salt of the earth. Okay? Then verse number 14, you are the light of the world. Why is it important? Because it says, you as a believer, once you have adopted and adapted the premise of the Beatitudes, now it is your job to, number one, give flavor to the earth. Okay? But also, what does salt do? It gives thirst. So because you are in the world, because you are a believer, because you have turned yourself over to God, people ought to thirst something higher. They ought to see you and say, there's flavor there. There's activity there. There's fervor there. Because I know Marvin, I want to know God. Because I know Michelle at school, I want to know God. Because I see George, I want to study more. Because I see Ken, I want to pray more. Because what's with the salt, then with the light. What does the light do? It, gives, it shines and gives direction to what? The whole house, the whole world. Meaning what? See, it's, it's all grows. It's all stair step. Once I quantify and qualify true happiness, then I am a disciple. Once I'm a disciple, I'm the salt of the world. Meaning what? People see the flavor and fervor in me and they have a greater thirst for God. Then, once they see me as the salt, then I'm allowed to give light. Meaning what? I can then shine to the whole world and give direction. Meaning what? I know Marvin. I now want to know God. If I follow Marvin, I will find God. And Jesus ends this, this spirit can be by reminding us that he is the fulfillment of of the law, not the abolishment of the law, because these things are countercultural in the Beatitudes, and the rest of the Sermon on the Mount speaks differently than the law. In the law, Moses said, but Jesus says, Here, this is not the law, it's love, it's truth, it's grace. Well, hold on, you're changing the law. I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law in my incarnality, because I am the Emmanuel. I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Somebody saying, well, Jeremy, I just want to be happy on this morning. I want a new car, I want a new house, I want a new job, I want a new man, I want a new woman. That ain't happiness. Hello, somebody? Get your new car. It's stressful. You got more payment. Hello, more gas. God forbid, God forbid something break. Because ain't nothing worse than a car note and a car repair. You know, uh, well, I want a new house. That, that could be most stressful. New house, new bills, new stuff you never thought of. I want a new man or woman. That's show enough more stress. Those things cannot bring happiness. But it's when I seek the word, the will, and the way of God that I can then be happy. I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. You want happiness? Come to God. If you are a child of God and you've stranded and stirred away from God, Come back to me before it's everlastingly to me. There's no peace away from God. If you are a child of God and you want to seek him again, repent of your sins. Confess. Ask for prayer. Ask for guidance, direction, and protection. You can do that. You can ask for prayer in the chat box below. You can email us at thegrayevents at gmail.com. When you do that, the leaders take control of that. They pray for you. They contact you. They do what we need to do as a family of God. If perchance you're not a child of God, then you really can't be happy. Well, Jeremy, what are you talking about? I got everything that I could ever want, but you're not happy. If you're not a baptized believer, if you've not accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, you are not in fact happy. You want to be happy? Hear the word of God. You've heard me out loud enough. You want to be happy? Believe that he is and that he's the reward of those who diligently seek him. You want to be happy? Repent of your sins. You want to be happy? Confess that there's no other sweeter name under man's tongue, under heaven by a mortal's tongue by which man can be saved. You want to be happy? Be baptized in the Christ for the mission of your sins. You can do that today. Life is too short. Eternity is too long. And hell is too high. You want to be saved? You want to be baptized? You want to accept Jesus on today? You can do so.
like something in the chat box right now. Slide in our DMs right now. Put it on Facebook and YouTube right now. Email us at thegraveits at gmail right now. Do what you need to do so you can really be happy. I'm not against psychotropic medication at all. You do what you need to do to put yourself in the right balance. But I'm going to tell you something. If you want the greatest happiness, it doesn't just emanate in a psychiatrist's office. It emanates at the feet of Jesus. Get your happiness. Child of God, come back to you. Not a child of God, come to you. I just want to be happy. Whoever you are, whatever you need, make the decision you need to make right now as we sing the song of invitation. We want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Good News from the Grave. We invite you at your earliest opportunity to join us here at the Gray Road Church of Christ. At the Gray Road Church, you will find a biblically-based, loving, and authentic body of believers in a multi-generational environment. We are located here in the Spring Grove community at 4826 Gray Road, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45232. Or we invite you to join us on our website, www.grayroadchurchofchrist.org, or please join us on our Facebook page, Instagram page, and Twitter page at your earliest convenience. We look forward to seeing you grow at the gray. We've got a wonder for you today. If you're looking for the praises of God, Jesus said these sad, sad words. You've already got your name. I'll tell the story. Pharisees stood on the streets when they prayed. They would say the same prayers over and over again. Oh. For a show to be seen by man. Jesus said, Don't you follow in their ways, doing good deeds, seeking other men's praises. Their pursuit of life is earthly, fortune, and fame. But in the end, it's all in vain. 